It's the teen store that became a style mecca. When I wanted to be cool, I knew that that was one of the brands that I needed to shop. It's collaborated with top designers and even supermodel Kate Moss. I think when you get someone like Kate Moss to front or design a collection, it is bound to create a ton of headlines and be spectacularly successful. But the store and its boss, Philip Green, are making headlines for all the wrong reasons. Profits are down and now he's shutting stores. This is a retail business with problems. If there were ever a time to show your brilliance, it's now. He denies doing anything wrong, but faces a string of allegations of sexual impropriety. The toxicity of Philip Green, given all the allegations against him, even though he denies them, um, is going to be very damaging for him. Once known as King of the High Street, critics now call him Sir Shifting. No Just go violence. away. Billionaire Spiv, which never received a knighthood. Last week, he staved off collapse, persuading landlords to slash rents. But is Philip Green's empire still in danger of unravelling? In the ever-changing world of fast fashion, is the store losing its cool? What is the trouble with Topshop? Spring 2009, Topshop boss Philip Green and supermodel Kate Moss at the grand opening of the store in New York. A British brand with a British tycoon at the helm and seemingly the world at his feet. Topshop was a Premier League. Everyone wanted to be on his arm. Everyone wanted to be in the photos. There was a sense of showing off. There was a sense of having fun. There was a sense of he has finally made it. But within a decade, Philip Green would be caught up in scandal and financial distress. The average day in our head office is 11 or 12 years. Did you, sir, do you mind not looking at me like that all the time? It's really disturbing. How did it all go so wrong? Well, I think to understand what's happened at Topshop, we need to go back more than 50 years. At the start of the 60s, there was no such thing as fashion for teenagers. We had to wear clothes like our mothers had worn, um, maybe the junior version of it. Ready-made clothes were all kind of American-inspired after the Second World War, um, so there was nothing revolutionary. Then youth culture swept through London. When it comes to music, when it comes to fashion, I think London is, in a way, more like a world capital. There was going to be a revolution. Teenagers were going to be in control of the future. Topshop was created to sell to this new teenage market. At first, it was just a small department in the Sheffield branch of the Peter Robinson clothing store. Since it was on the first floor of Peter Robinson shops, it became known as Top Shop at Peter Robinson, and that's where the name emerged from. Great, so Hilton, what we need to do... Um... Jeff Banks was a young entrepreneur when he got a call from Peter Robinson's to help find a way to attract young shoppers to its London branch. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's like whether or not the British man is ready for this yet, I'm not sure. And the colour. And the colour. The managing director at the time, he rang me up and said that they had a little basement um, in Oxford Circus um, and he had this idea of opening a cafe down there. Um, where young people could actually come while their mums were shopping upstairs. OK, so if we could actually take that into these two as well, yeah, so they the follow on from there. Certainly work with the, uh... the space they had to play with was not large. It would have been this length as wide again, so a bit bigger than this, but again, four shops, one in each corner, and the cafe in the middle. 
The manager of the Topshop brand was a rising star of the retail world, Ralph Halpin. Ralph believed in retailing as theatre and therefore he was great at creating the environment that attracted people in. He found that behind the brick wall in the basement, there was this massive empty space that was unused. So he knocked the wall down and suddenly Topshop had this incredible basement. And that really was when Topshop started to take on its real identity and became um, a serious player. At Oxford Circus, you'll find Topshop where all great fashions start, underground. It's all very well giving birth to Topshop, but it eventually ate its mother. The stores had to give more and more space to Topshop because it was generating more turnover and profit. Peter Robinson as a brand faded away gracefully and Topshop took over. The future looked bright for Topshop, but fashion's a fast-moving business and it's hard for any retailer to keep ahead of trends. So where did it all start to go wrong? Philip Green built a reputation as the king of the high street, but recently his empire has teetered on the edge of collapse. I want to understand what the trouble is at Topshop. Fashion's a tricky business to second guess, so I've recruited three young women to help me. Carly runs her own entertainment business. I really like Topshop. It's very me, like I can always pretty much find something for myself in there. Right, okay, right, so where do you want to head to first? Let's go to Primark. So go Primark. But Amelia, who's a student, isn't so keen. I think Topshop's quite a high-end brand. I always think it's quite expensive for what it is. And Chantal, who's studying textile engineering, prefers to buy online. I don't like shopping in store. Um, I feel like it's very busy. I've given the shoppers £50 each to buy an outfit for a night out. They're going to shop at Topshop and an alternative store of their choice. But they can only keep one outfit. On the way, I've asked them to rate their experience in store. First up, Topshop. They look scary. It looks like it's just walked off the runway, which can be quite threatening to like an everyday, just like, buyer. Carly, meanwhile, is right at home. Yeah, it's exciting, it's beautiful. Like, it's, it's got loads of pops of colour, it's bright, it's got screens, it's got lights. Like, it's, it's a beautiful store, definitely. It's very loud in here. Like, it's almost like I'm in the party itself, not shopping for the party. First impressions of the store itself are mixed, but all my shoppers are finding the clothes expensive. £49 for a pair of shoes. £49. £150. <laughs> to be fair, I always know when stuff is heavily embellished like this, it's always at the higher price point value to the customer is extremely important when they're making a purchase and Topshop sometimes it can be more on the expensive side. I think that's going to look really nice on you. Just to be curious, how much are we talking? What's the price point? The skirt is £44 and the top is £39. So you're paying separately for the outfit? Each, each piece is separate? I'm about to put it back. Oh my gosh, my heart bleeds. That's heartbreaking. That is very I was really in love with that. A hesitant start, then, for my shoppers. In the past, Topshop's strength was that it really knew how to draw shoppers in. Every time a Topshop arrived in a new town, we'd make a big fuss, invite the local media, we'd tell the police we're going to stop the traffic. Celebrities were invited to the openings to boost the brand, such as Radio One's iconic first female DJ, Annie Nightingale. For some reason, I would do these shop openings with a womble, and we got mobs. It was so bizarre and, and strange, but huge fun to do. It wasn't just store openings that made Topshop popular, 
Its high street look fitted what many young shoppers wanted. Well, it's Saturday, isn't it? But that made it all the more surprising for Geraldine and Wayne Hemingway, the team behind cutting edge label Red or Dead, when they got a call from Topshop asking if they were interested in selling their range in store. At first, we just thought, no way. It was a place that employed buyers to find out what designers were doing, especially catwalk designers, and do watered down versions of it. And, and so you stay a mile away from it if you're anything to do with fashion. But the brand's Oxford Street store did hold an appeal. It helped us on our journey with Red or Dead because it, it was a case of getting the exposure on Oxford Street was, was amazing, but we were being put in front of a different audience. Bringing cutting edge labels in store also helped Topshop's image. The store was always on the lookout for ways to market its clothes to a wider audience. In the 1980s, it became the sponsor of Miss World, keeping the contract for eight years. All the managers went along to the Royal Albert Hall. It was very much seen as a way of bringing those people in to see this was a business that was going somewhere. But was the staff treat in danger of turning customers away? If you are a young avant-garde woman, you don't actually look on Miss World as being an activity that you want to aspire to. It'd be very wrong, I think, for something like Topshop to sponsor that. Very wrong. It was around this time that Topshop's flamboyant boss, Ralph Halpern, found himself at the centre of one of the first big kiss-and-tell newspaper stories. Ralph Halpern was a character in all sorts of ways. He was seen as Britain's outstanding retailer, but he also had quite a, a colourful private life um, with a number of alleged affairs. His behaviour could sometimes be a bit outrageous. Well, I must <laughs> confess that probably the only thing I remember about Ralph Halpern is, what was it, seven times a night, <laughs> and um, those extraordinary headlines. A lot of people, uh, particularly the more establishment people, didn't think that that was the kind of way that a, a managing director of a, a, a then FTSE 100 company should behave. Ralph Halpern's time had come and gone. Topshop's future lay elsewhere. I think the thing is, you know, the question of does the price match the quality? I mean, I think you've got to look at what we charge. So I think we're moving the quality on, but we're not changing the price. Philip Green was a middle-class kid, grew up in leafy North London, went to a nice school, Carmel College in Oxfordshire. Um, he left school and sort of reverse gentrified himself. He roughed himself up and started speaking with a Cockney accent. All his life, he'd wanted to become a big player. You know, he wanted to become famous, he wanted to become respected, he wanted to be the big player on the block. In 1988, Philip Green got his chance when he was appointed chief executive of a public limited company, Amber Day. His four years at Amber Day were characterised by a freewheeling, fairly entrepreneurial, aggressive approach, which is not very usual in the public markets. And to start with, that made quite a lot of money. The share price shot up. And he was seen suddenly as a success story and started getting good publicity. But Philip Green didn't like the rules that came with running a public company, he didn't like the scrutiny, and started getting a bad press. As profits fell, Philip Green and Amber Day parted company. In the end, the city got jittery about the way he was running things. And it gave him a bit of grit in his oyster and something to prove. At Topshop, trouble was also looming. The store had largely had the youth market to itself, but its success would attract new and very successful rivals from overseas. Zara's ability to have different collections turned around so fast makes every other fashion retailer look sedentary and conservative and unfashionable in comparison. 
I think what we've seen from Zara in the past few years has been a phenomenal takeover of the UK high street and also across the globe. And I think that Topshop must be affected by that switch in terms of the brand really growing recognition, especially in the fashion domain. So how is Topshop faring against the competition with my shoppers? They struggle to find an outfit they like for £50 in Topshop. How are they getting on in other stores? I'm a fan of this and for, I think it's like £16. I feel like this is, uh, people could look at this and say, oh, where'd you get that from? Oh, you get that shop value of, that's from Primark. Oh my gosh, no way. Carly's equally pleased with the options in Zara. I do like that, but I like it. I think it's edgy with the shoulder pads. I like it. <laughs> we can do this. Well, it's hard now. <laughs> I don't know which one to fit. And in new look, Chantal is making progress. But it's lovely. It's gorgeous. I think we found, I mean, I think, I think that, yeah. Top shops' rivals are giving the store a run for its money. At the start of the 21st century, future boss Philip Green was also having a run of success, buying struggling department store British Home Stores. He bought it for £200 million and very quickly made a whole lot more money than that by selling and leasing back the properties. And he was hailed as a hero for the way the profits surged under his ownership. Green was a really serious player and he showed the city he had what it took to take over an ailing company, um, turn it around and make loads of money. Everybody knew that Philip Green wasn't going to be satisfied with BHS. It also meant where was he going to go next. So, you know, there was quite a lot of trepidation throughout the high street. He already runs one of the country's best-known chains. Now BHS boss Philip Green hopes his bid for Arcadia will make him king of the British high street. In 2002, Topshop's parent company, Arcadia, was bought by Taviter Investments. Its owner is Philip Green's wife. Topshop catapulted him into the big time. Um, it put him into contact with star designers, star models, got him seats on the front of catwalk shows. And when he bought it in 2002, it was really humming. Another brand in the Arcadia stable is Miss Selfridge. One of its former designers remembers the new boss. He was very supportive of Miss Selfridge and he had a soft spot for the brand, I think. Because we were the baby sister, maybe we had less pressure on us than Topshop did. Topshop had been fighting back against its rivals and by the time Philip Green took over in 2002, the store was the jewel in his Arcadia crown. It was almost, you know, like a sleeping giant waking up and things seemed to be happening. People like my daughters would never have shopped in Topshop. They would have always gone to independent designers and suddenly they were going and buying Topshop Unique and, and, and you know, and, and, and it, it suddenly became well, obviously cool to, to, to buy Topshop. Green inherited this brilliant machine, very well oiled, staffed with very talented people with a hugely loyal customer base. And um, he loved it. He, he basked in the reflected glamour. The old Topshop had sponsored Miss World. Under Philip Green, the store sponsored new designer awards. In 2005, it became the first ever high street store to show its own collection at London Fashion Week. At that time, it was basically unheard of for a high street brand to own their own catwalk show. But you can see that they were, you know, starting to elevate the whole feeling around the brand and, and making it more, more fashionable and more kind of lift the whole image of the company. At the centre of it all was the flagship store here at Oxford Circus in London. When young people come in, it's almost like going to a club or, you know, going, you know, going out in the, on a Friday night was not just about shopping clothes, it was more about going in and getting inspired. I mean, when people came into London, people like Beyonce or Rihanna or Madonna, 
one of the first things they used to do was go to Topshop and buy the jeans or the T-shirts or whatever accessories. That was the real hot place. And it turned over 100 million pounds and then much more in the coming years. Philip Green reaped the rewards of Topshop success. In 2005, Arcadia paid a dividend of over a billion pounds to his wife, who lived in Monaco, meaning the payment was tax-free. At that point in time, he received universal praise for that dividend, because the impression was the boy's done good, everyone, politicians, the press, the fashion industry clapped and said, well done. Hilary Alexander was fashion director at the Daily Telegraph when she heard that Topshop was on the verge of announcing a major coup involving supermodel Kate Moss. We'd heard rumours that Kate was going to come to London Fashion Week and all of a sudden there she was sitting, you know, she arrived with Philip and of course we immediately all thought and knew she must be doing a collection for Topshop. They were right, super cool ads would promote the Kate Moss collection. Even the staff were excited. I remember Kate Moss coming into head office and it really caused a frenzy. She came in off-duty model, um, was upstairs with Philip working on the collection. Um, we weren't allowed to approach her or speak to her and um, to leave her be to work on that collection. In the race to sign up Kate Moss, Philip Green had beaten major rivals such as H&M, who had also wanted to collaborate with the supermodel. We had also, we had, we had, had discussions, but, but the top shop, they made it and we had the discussion, so. So, so they made it reality. We knew that it was going to send Topshop to another level yet again. Um, I think, again, we were m probably most jealous <laughs> at Miss Selfridge of that collaboration. Can, can we move everybody outside, please? Monday, the 30th of April, 2007. Crowds descended on Topshop for the launch. And I remember the day that she was going to appear in the windows of Topshop Oxford Circus and all the traffic stopped. There were crazy queues around the block just to see her in the window, let alone go in and buy something. It was a really big moment for British fashion because Topshop and Kate Moss together, sort of a fashion marriage made in heaven. With Kate Moss on his arm, Philip Green was gearing up to take on his next challenge. Let's go. America. Back home, though, the fashion market was about to go through a seismic shift. Online shopping would change the business forever. Was Topshop ready for the challenge? Taking Topshop to America in 2009 was a dream come true for Philip Green. He wanted to take it overseas, and that was the vision he had, conquering the US with Kate Moss on his arm. I don't think anybody would dispute Kate's a style icon. I think everyone was really observing what they were doing in, in US, thinking what if they were to make the same kind of impact on the, on the on the, on the market in New York or in the US. I went over to New York with um, quite a few other British press for the opening, and it was, it was a real spectacular. If you can break American fashion, you are in a spectacular place. The flip side, though, is it is incredibly competitive in America, and it's very rare that international retailers really make America a success. Some of the New York fashion press obviously knew what Topshop was because they'd been at London Fashion Week, they'd probably shopped there. They weren't quite sure how would it play in New York. So I think there was quite a, a sense of wait and see, if you like. Three, two, one! Sir Philip was reported as hoping to open 20 to 30 flagship American stores, but the US adventure has not lived up to the initial hype. 
So going into the store, I felt that, wow, this really makes sense in London, but it really doesn't make all that sense here because it's, it's different in New York. So Top Shop on Broadway, and I was in there a week ago, it just, it's well run, clean, tidy, but it looks ordinary. It doesn't look as special as some of the other retailers in America. They became kind of world champion in their home market, but had difficulty to expand that, the model and the impact and the feeling and the energy beyond the UK market. Last week, Topshop's parent group confirmed its 11 American stores are now earmarked for closure. So, had the American adventure caused Topshop to take its eye off the ball back at home? Online retailer ASOS, which uses bold ads to draw in young shoppers, began its revolution of the high street back in 2000. ASOS started out as as seen on screen, and the idea was you could buy what people on TV were wearing. Sometimes there were clothing items that people wanted to buy, a watch on David Beckham or a dress on Victoria Beckham. How do I get that dress? How do I buy that dress? And as it evolved, it became more than that. They hired people from Arcadia, actually, from um, the Arcadia Topshop stable, and turned into much more of a fashion retail destination. On the high street, many were slow to recognise the potential of online retailers. You know, in the beginning, I think we or myself were more occupied with the bigger competitors, you know, what kind of move were they doing. And there was so much snobbishness towards online fashion that ASOS wasn't a real fashion brand, that it wasn't a credible brand at that time. And many brands didn't have an online store at that time. Working as a business editor at the Sunday Times, Oliver Shah remembers talking to Philip Green about the rise of online shopping. I would speak to him and he'd say things like, you should see their returns rate, ASOS. It's 30, 40%, it'll kill them, it won't work. He didn't think it was going to catch on. He thought people would always want to go into the store and feel the fabric, try things on, have the experience. Traditional stores were slow to respond to the threat from online upstarts. This created a gap for many other new brands to fill, and within 10 years, they became businesses turning over more than 100 million pounds. Companies such as Boohoo, Misguided, and Pretty Little Thing are now the places where many young people shop. As time went, obviously, you start to realize that they are onto something really, really good. And then again, other platforms came to the market. And then it's just to face it, I mean, that's going to be the new, that's, that's the dynamic of the market. There were rumors about rivalry between Philip Green and the founder of ASOS. I uncovered plenty of people who told me about the various phone calls between him and Nick Roberts and the ASOS founder. The sort of expletive laden, stop effing, nicking my staff stuff, and Robertson saying, no, effing won't, and this kind of stuff. Um, it was well known the two had a sort of playful and sometimes less playful rivalry. One of those who jumped ship early on was former Miss Selfridge designer Sarah Wilkinson. I remember when Philip Green reached out to Nick Robertson to place ASOS product in Topshop Oxford Circus. We were all extremely excited. We thought that it would catapult the brand even further to being a more credible fashion brand. But Nick was stubborn and he wanted to keep ASOS purely online. And so we never did go into Topshop. Missing the online wave has been one of the key mistakes long term Topshop has made. He misread, as many others did too, to be fair, how smartphones were going to pr proliferate, how app based shopping was going to become the number one thing. So that left Topshop playing catch up for a long period of time. Topshop launched online in 2000. The wider group now has many successful sites. So, how does Topshop.com compare to its rivals? Celebrities often use Instagram to promote their looks, so I challenge my shoppers to see if they could copy one of their favourite outfits. They'll shop on the Topshop site and on a rival online store of their choice. First up, Topshop. 
So I picked a photo from Holly Willoughby. It's from her Instagram page. I love her outfit. I think it's really close to what I'd wear in my natural style. All right, so I'm looking for a Rita Ora inspired outfit. It's really quite cool, quite vintagey, really grungy and rock and roll, which is very much my vibe. I saw a picture of Leomi Anderson, who's a Victoria's Secret model, and I just love this outfit. So yeah, I'm trying to, trying to find it. <laughs> Slightly hideous that. I would I don't think I'd feel comfortable in that. You know, Todrick have really nice shoes. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing. It has the whole cohort there, which is pretty much the Rita Ora look, but it's just in a skirt instead of pants. The one thing I am noticing through shopping online is they don't have a lot of sizes. Please be Oh no, it's all sold out. Why would you put that link at the bottom if it's gonna upset you like that? <laughs> It's coming in at 87 pounds, which is quite expensive. Now they're offering free standard delivery. So next day delivery is six pounds, which is quite extortionate really for next day delivery, but I want it fast, so <laughs> I'd pay it. I'd just pay six pounds. Topshop um, give you the chance to see the item on a model and then off a model, which is really nice. I wish they had like videos so I could see what they look like on, like when you move around in them. Yeah, it's a nice website. Everything's quite clear. Overall, I think the site wasn't too bad to use. I think it was quite good. I could find things easily. So yeah, that was quite an easy experience, actually. I'm quite impressed. <laughs> Topshop.com, done. So how do the competitors stand up? So for the next site, I think I'm going to have a look on Boohoo. Now I'm going to take a look on Misguided. So we're going to look at ASOS now for same outfit. Oh, there's a tartan one straight away. So many different styles, and they're very bold. So that brings it down to 451 styles, which is a lot to go through. The amount of choice impresses my shoppers, and once again, Topshop's rivals seem less expensive. It's under 100 for ASOS, including delivery, so definitely a lot cheaper on ASOS. My shoppers found the sites very similar to use, but which brand do they think best matches their celebrity picture? So the outfit I'm gonna go for is the Topshop outfit. The top's a little bit oversized, which isn't my kind of go-to style, but I think the rest of it works really, really well. I'm really, really happy. <laughs> You could get the tartan on ASOS and you couldn't get the one on Topshop, so it was just that better option for me. Plus, you could get the band t-shirt as well, and we couldn't get that on Topshop, so definitely matches Rita Ora better. Like, I'm really digging it, I really like it. So I went with the misguided outfit because it really matches what Leomi wore, and it's also a lot cheaper than Topshop. In this straw poll of online fashion, only one of my shoppers chose Topshop.com as their best match for celebrity style. Young people are so fickle in how they shop, there's no loyalty in the way there was 20 years ago. And people will just migrate to the cheaper and smarter and quicker operator. In order for Topshop to maintain their success on the UK high street, I feel like they need to invest more in technology and that is really the same for every high street retailer in the space. Competition from online rivals wasn't the only trouble facing Topshop. In 2015, boss Sir Philip Green sold BHS for just one pound. At the time, it may have seemed like good business, but it cost him his reputation. Can Topshop and its boss ever recover from the fallout? In 2016, BHS collapsed with a massive pension deficit. It was only a year after Sir Philip had sold the store for a pound. 
Contrasting the tens of millions he'd spent on a luxury yacht with the fate of the BHS pensioners, the top shop boss found himself the poster boy for the failings of modern capitalism. His behaviour was exposed. Can you just answer a couple of Go questions? Go away. Have you got a message Which for bit are you not understanding? Hang on, hang on, hang on. There's no just need for Go away. EHS is one of the biggest corporate scandals of modern times. How he was seen to be trying to run away from the pension liabilities. He was hauled through Parliament. Did you, sir, do you mind not looking at me like that all the time? It's really disturbing. Hauled through the press, called Sir Shifty. There were calls for his knighthood to be stripped. A billionaire spiv who should never receive the knighthood. When uh, the BHS crisis explodes and Philip Green is pulled into that vacuum and has to go and speak to Parliament, handle the fallout, deal with, you know, enormous amounts of crisis. It, it, it's clear, if you understand organisations, that that would have come at the expense of more focus on Topshop. Sir Philip apologised to the BHS pensioners, but did the fallout put the store's young customers off? I think young consumers are really becoming more aware about brands and their values and their DNA and how they go about operating and how they affect the planet. They realise wherever they spend their money, they could either help building a brand or they can basically walk away from a brand. So obviously when that happened at that time, definitely that would... I would presume that have had a negative impact on, on the perception of brand. He eventually paid a big chunk of the pension deficit, so he did, in the end, do the right thing, but it was a very damaging nine-month period, um, and that did a lot of reputational harm to him. Remarkably, this was far from the end of the troubles. In October last year, there was a backlash after Topshop pulled an in-store pop-up selling a feminist book. It said the decision didn't reflect its stance on feminism, so Philip apologised, saying it had been a genuine misunderstanding. It's a misjudgment, and it shows that he's not on his game, he's not thinking in the smart way he used to. But then Sir Philip was named in Parliament as the British boss who'd gone to court to stop a newspaper publishing claims of racial and sexual harassment. He'd spent a fortune blocking the story, but he was now headline news again. He categorically denied allegations of racist and sexist behaviour, insisting that all staff complaints were thoroughly investigated and that any claims were settled with the agreement of all parties and their legal advisers. But did Topshop feel the impact once again? Cool ads promote pop star Beyonce's gymwear label Ivy Park, which she founded with Sir Philip. Following almost a year of negotiations, she chose to buy him out. You know, she comes out and says what she really believes. She's a feminist as well. She's decided that she's not going to continue working with Topshop. The toxicity of Philip Green, given all the allegations against him, even though he denies them, um, is going to be very damaging for him. And the fact that someone like Beyonce, who was precisely the kind of celebrity he would have courted so assiduously in the old days, has dropped him, is a very bad sign. And the bad headlines keep on coming. Philip Green found himself facing trial in Arizona after Pilates instructor Kate Sturridge accused him of repeatedly touching her inappropriately. Again, he strenuously denied the allegations. When you've got such a public persona, you have to be whiter than white. It isn't just your own business that suffers. It's the damage to everything you've created. It's an absolute own goal. Even before the headlines, there was concern that Topshop was losing some of its sparkle. But the last time I was at a Topshop on Oxford Street, one thing that I, you know, felt uh, was that the, there wasn't that kind of the energy that I felt, you know, in the past. So you need to, you know, go back to say how, what made us so good creating that energy? How do you do that today? That is what Topshop has been good at over the years, 
reinventing themselves for their customer and really bringing newness to the table. But that fight's not over yet. It's completely not on the radar of, of my family now. And for, for a number of reasons, you know, number one, I don't think the product is where it was and, and is quite as exciting at the, in, as it was in the 90s. And that's because there's so many other people doing it, including independents who are, who are doing fast, you know, being faster at the moment. This is really the time for him to prove his retail worth. If he is the king of retail, now is the time to do it. There's a golden opportunity, actually, with brands that have got legacy, like Topshop, to turn it around, to show us what he's made of, to show his embracing technology, but most of all, that it connects with a consumer of tomorrow. My shoppers have been putting the brand to the test. They've bought a £50 outfit from Topshop and a rival store, but they can keep only one. Time to decide. There's good news for Sir Philip and his business. Two out of my three shoppers chose the Topshop outfit, but they think the store still has work to do. OK, so, ladies, what do you think about Topshop? Starting with you, Amelia. I was a little bit disappointed with Topshop. I'm not going to lie to you. Why is that? I feel like it's overpriced for what it is. So I agree with Amelia. Um, Topshop isn't necessarily the first shop that I'm, I go to when I want to buy something, just because it is really expensive. And I found, like, when I try and shop online as well, um, they just don't have the range. I've got a bit of a conflicting view. Like, I really like Topshop, but for what it is, I can see how you guys feel that it's a little bit... It's just really quite up there with the price mark at the moment compared to other places. And everything's online these days, so I think they just need to boost the website a bit. It's difficult to know, really, exactly how Topshop's doing on the high street today. It's just one store in the much bigger Arcadia group and owned by Tavita Investments. Unlike a public company, Tavita Investments doesn't have to publish financial information for shareholders, but some figures are available. We do know from the most recent accounts for the year to August 2017 that operating profits came down from about 215 million to about 124 million. In the run-up to Christmas, there were reports that sales across the Arcadia Group in the 12 weeks to mid-November had fallen by over 16%. To save his empire, Philip Green was forced to negotiate a rescue plan that involved closing up to 48 stores, investing more than £300 million and persuading landlords to take a huge cut in their rent. It was touch and go whether landlords and investors would accept the deal. This is a retail business with problems. There was already uh, a week's delay in trying to convert people into agreeing to these arrangements. There's a lot of talk of jobs being saved, stores being saved, but I don't think that's truly going to be the case. If anyone asks me, I think certainly you're going to be looking at still store closures. You're going to be looking at probably a loss of some of the brands from the portfolio. So it's going to be a much leaner business going forward. Is that the success he really wanted? When it comes to creating an experience in store, Topshop has historically led the way. It's seen as a higher-end brand. But these are turbulent times for the high street with stiff competition online. Many young shoppers prefer faster, cheaper options at the click of a button. Now, I really don't want to see Topshop fade into the shadow of its online competition, but that does, of course, mean it's more crucial than ever that the store is in touch with what its young customers want. I think that there's deep-rooted affection for Topshop. It's still there to show people what is cool and how it should be styled. So I think it would be a terrible loss if we were to lose them from the UK high street. 
It helped build pyramids and raise pharaohs, and Bethany Hughes is in awe of it at the Nile. Egypt's Great River continues new tomorrow at nine. Trust no one next as we hear from the victims of family fraud. Robbing from your relatives is after the break.